The Corn Thicket Podcast with Kyle and Howie, presented by Realtree. All right. Well, here we are. Welcome back to the Corn Thicket. Uh, I'm Howie. Kyle is out golfing today on his day off. He was going to try to join us, but he started the golfing at 8 o'clock this morning. It is now uh, noon his time, and he's on hole 13. So he is not <laughs> he's not going to be joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to have a longtime friend, very good friend, um, Jeff Hale, outdoor enthusiast, writer extraordinaire, uh, hunter, uh, beyond most people's wildest dreams as far as what you've experienced uh, strategically <laughs> built your your hunting history here. So we're going to dig into some of that. Um, so how you been, bud? I'm okay. How are you? Not too bad. Good to you... be back in the in the world of Howie again. Yeah, yeah. And out of the dentist chair. You were there a little bit <laughs> I earlier. I just came there. from the dentist. I'm a little numb. I can, yeah. can't feel my nose. But... Yeah, start drooling on yourself. You normally do that when you're around me anyway. Though, so. it, it happens. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, what have you been doing with yourself? You just got back from British Columbia, right? I did. I did. Uh, we were in the, uh, well, I was in, in the uh, Cassiar Mountain Range of northern British Columbia. Yeah. It's a very rugged, remote area. And I uh, just got back from a hunt there for, I was gone about two weeks, and um, managed to get a good goat, a good Rocky yeah. Mountain goat. We're anticipating that it'll easily make the book so yeah. it was a good hunt yeah so uh you planned that one for quite a while right i mean that was one of your bucket list hunts well actually uh, yes and no i didn't really plan that one for very long at all because i was in alaska last year on my first attempt at goat and had some terrible luck it uh it rained right terrible rains right. you know monsoon rains it was the <laughs> wettest august right. on record in southeast right. alaska and I was there for that, and uh, so we, you know, we got weathered out. We didn't get the goat. We we couldn't even see goats because we were in the clouds right. every time. So, right. so that didn't happen. And then my wife uh, got a text message from one of the outfitters about an opening, and right. it was sort of a last minute thing. She said, "Jeff, you need to do this." Right. So without any preparation or any long range planning at all, we just sort of jumped into that. Oh, see, I didn't know that, so I figured you've been training. So, so let me back up for a second here. You've been you've been wanting a goat for a while, though. Yeah, that's, kind of, that's been kind of one of your bucket list items there, though. Well, for sure, because I'm getting along in age, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, the longer you wait for these kind of things, the, the worse it's going to be for you. So, right. it was it was important for me to try to get in those those mountain hunts that are difficult, yeah, that are hard to yeah. do before I get too old. Right. You know, right. Right. Really. I'm probably already there. I know I'm younger than you, but I'm I'm all right. I beat this body up. Um, it's it's so, uh, it's not the age; it's the miles. Right, right, yeah, exactly. It's the miles. Indiana Jones said, that. "Yeah, yeah." And the road you're on for those miles too, you beat that <laughs> suspension right up. Hey, um, hold on. Sorry, I'm a little dry today. Um, so you get this text message, and how long did you have? You you mentioned no long range preparation, so I know. Mountain goat hunting is one of the most challenging hunts you can go on. I'm, I'm not sure how it competes with, well, with bighorn and things like that. I think I've heard that it's more, but how long did you have to to get your get your cardio together, and and, and what did you do, and just just generally take us through through the whole story, if you don't oh, mind. Oh well, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, to to address the first question, uh, most most people in the hunting world would consider that. Rocky Mountain Goat is North America's most difficult hunt. Mm -hmm. Now, hunt, comparing one hunt to another, you can have variation. Sure. But generally yeah. speaking, you know, there's an old adage that the, the goat hunting begins where the sheep hunting ends. Right. You know, that by and large, goats are, are more difficult just because they're harder to reach. Right. Um, but I got a, a, a message in the middle of May. And, again, my wife sort of uh, pressed me to do it. Right. You know, she said, you, you need to do this. You know, she's the always the devil on my left shoulder, but always right. for good things. Right. She's the, I always say she's the only wife I've ever heard of that'll sit there and randomly say, Jeff, you need more guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You need I, to go on a goat. 
I said, Kat, I don't, I didn't do any planning for that. I don't have any, uh, any money saved up for that. She said, life is short. You need to go. Yeah. So it was about May 15th that, that I realized I was going Right. And I had till the end of August to get ready. So, you know, basically the summer I had to, to devote to that. So, you know, as far as getting in shape, the, the thing that you have to understand about something like this, so those those kind of northern mountains that you that you encounter in British Columbia, I mean, they, uh, they, they're they difficult. And the elevation is not super high. You know, on average, you're around 6,000 feet. Right. But the... Uh, the steepness of them can be severe, and you're going to be putting on a lot of miles. And, of course, you're above timberline, so it's all rock. And, I mean, that's typical sheep or goat hunting type country. And for an Easterner like like we are in the kind of world we live in here, there's really no way to replicate that right. to, to train for it. Right. There, there's no practical way to do it. You can talk about taking stadium stairs if you want to. Right. You can do this, that, and the other, but until you get there, you really can't do replicate that kind of uh, situation. So, you know, I did what what I would say, based on my limited experience, would probably be the best approach is just getting the best general shape you can get right. with whatever exercise you tend to gravitate to. For me, it was uh, I ride a bicycle, and I put on uh, less miles than I normally do because I was doing other things this year. But I put on about a thousand miles prior to that on my yeah. bicycle, and then I also uh, managed to get about 150 miles. Well, actually, exactly 150 miles of trail walking with a heavy pack, and right. by heavy, I would say maybe 45 to 50 pounds, which right. really isn't heavy. Right, right. But you know, for general use, it was it was okay. So I had the the packing and the the biking, and that you know. Puts a guy, I guess, if you have a good base, in, in general, good condition, and that's what you need to be. But there, there is no preparedness for that. Right. There is right. none. Once you get there, you're in a whole different environment. Right. It's completely different, and uh, and and you you're going to find out that you just have to take that good general physical base that you have, and then be able to just adapt right. and tough it out. Yeah. So you got there. You land, and you have to take bush planes in? Yeah, you have to, it, takes, uh, it takes three from here. It takes three commercial flights from here in Pennsylvania to get out there. And then once there, um, because we're in northern British Columbia, the best jumping off point is actually in the Yukon. Okay. So we're, uh, you could fly into Whitehorse, which right. is the normal uh, en- entry point for hunters in the Yukon, but, right. but we were just going to go south. So from Whitehorse, you take a uh, commercial charter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to say it's it's somewhere between two and three hundred miles, but closer to two hundred, right? Uh, two hundred plus miles down into the the Cassiar Range, and there there you come to the base camp. And uh, I was I was in base camp for maybe a half an hour. Just just enough time to get on the dock and, and reorganize my stuff and weed out some things I wanted to leave there. Right. And then I'm right back in the air again, this time in a Super Cub. Right. Uh, of course, that's just a, a single engine aircraft that holds two people, the pilot and someone else. Right. But if that someone else is six foot three and 240 pounds <laughs> like I am, you need to grease me up to get me into that thing, you know, and a shoehorn to get out. You know, right. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. But uh, and then you fly another 60 miles into uh, the spike camp that was chosen for me. Right. Because there's uh, four hunters in camp at that particular time. Mm-hmm. And there were more before me and more after me. But, right. but I was there for that time period. So we fly in 60 miles, get dropped off on a lake. And mm-hmm. that's where I met my guide. He was already there. Yeah. And he already had a goat um, checked out, you know, some mm-hmm. something to look at right away. Yeah. So you have a, a six-hour window after you fly that you can't on hunt. Right. So once that was up, we went and took a look at this goat. Right. And uh, you know that's that's how the, the hunt began. Was yeah. like that. So is that the goat that you ended up taking? Oh no. 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 Okay. No. No. Well, let's continue that. Well, okay. <laughs> so so here's the thing. You know, um, 
again, I, I was in Alaska the previous year right. on my first goat hunt. Right. And it's not my first mountain hunt, but it was my first backpack hunt. Right. Where it's all, you're all on your feet. Right. It's just you, your feet, and your iron will to get you up and down wherever right. you're going. Right. And my feet took a terrible beating, you know. Mm -hmm. um, my boots weren't as well broken in as I thought they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have any pre preventative uh, preparation on my feet. I just went with them, you know, just normal. And uh, by the end of that hunt, even though I did limited hiking, my feet were just destroyed with blisters. I couldn't walk for two weeks after that hunt. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that I did better. So my, my boots had about a, that 150 extra miles right. on them. Right. And this time I had tape. I'm going to mm -hmm. tape my feet up before I start to, right. to hunt. Right. Well, I got in there and my guide, Brad, said, you know, we have a goat over here. Uh, it's by itself, so there's a good chance it could be a billy, you right. know. Yeah. So we need to go check it out. And it's just a short walk this direction so right. you know, let's do that and i thought well you know it's just a short walk I, I, we're not really getting into it till tomorrow i don't need to tape up my feet i just didn't do that right and you know where it's, you know where it's going <laughs> yeah that yeah. that short walk turned into four or five hours of side hilling right and steep terrain and that's all it took yeah. that's all it took by the time i got back i had a bad blister yeah i was starting right out of the gate and i was yeah. so angry at myself for not Right. You know, getting taking so, taking five minutes and yeah. taping yourself up. So I did uh, for the rest of the week. I I took good care of that blister and you know put stuff on it and taped yeah. it up real well. So it it ended up never being terrible, but it, it did you know affect yeah. me a little bit. Right, right. But you got to take care of your feet. You know, right. you got to keep them dry. Right. You got to keep them in good shape, or yeah. or your toast on yeah. something like that because well, it's very I, physical. Yeah, when I used to guide elk hunts out in Colorado. Um, that's one of the things I learned early on. I used to get, and, and this isn't a knock on them, it was my selection of boots that was a problem. Of the, every, every brand of boot has a spectrum, right, of, of quality across. You know, they had the more affordable ones. I was a college student, and after, after grad school, didn't have much, so I'd buy what I could. Um, but I finally had a seasoned guide tell me, and I was just burning through boots. My feet wouldn't get beat up too bad because it's, it's a little bit different. We were side hilling and stuff, but um, mountains of Colorado are obviously different than up where you were. Um, plus, I was younger. That's going to be the main thing, right? <laughs> you can heal overnight, basically. <laughs> but um, the main thing for me that the old guy told me was get laced to toe. Because if, if you – he told me, and it wasn't even so much for your feet getting beat up, but, you know, the, the boots that come down like the standard – the laces come down the standard distance. Then if you get the ones that lace – out to the toe, right? He said that provides more stability, and that stability, it just keeps your foot from sliding, basically is what he was saying, within the boot. Yeah. And he said that's why you turn your ankle. And now I hadn't turned an ankle, but I'd been around several people who I'd been hunting with while I was guiding out there would turn theirs, and then they'd be, you're screwed. Like you said, just like your feet, you, you, tur you turn your ankle, you're done. You're done. And, uh, um, you know, when I switched over to that, and then I found a certain brand of boot, um, and it's funny because this was, oh, my, this was turn of the century. <laughs> we can refer to that, right? Yeah. So this is 20-some years ago. And uh, I found a boot that, that worked for me. Okay. Right? And I got it at Cabela's. And um, then I got wind that, you know, you start looking and you're like, mm, they're, they're changing that boot. Like, you start noticing they're changing it. I bought six pairs of those boots did you really and then what i do is i every time i buy a new pair of shoes that has a silica gel in it yeah. i'd open those boxes up and throw keep, them in trying them to in. save them trying to save you them. still have them? i still have them yeah i still have a couple pairs of them yeah actually wow. so well um, that's the thing you you mentioned the, the boots uh, you know and how they they change their line but the, yeah. also the companies themselves change in their reputation for reliability mm -hmm. you know if you talk to guides in the field you know, that's one of the main topics of conversation is what yeah, boot what these boot days yeah. is the one. Because yeah. that one used to be good yeah. and now it longer is. The other ones used to be good. Yeah. Now these are supposed to be good. Yeah. And it goes on and, and on. And not just the boot, right? It's the sole, which is a completely different thing, right? Because they partner with different ones providing the sole. I've always, these ones have Vibram soles on them. I've had really good luck. Well, that's with them. kind of they, industry standard yeah, now, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But at the time, everyone yeah. was kind of still making their own. 
Like there were yeah. a lot of lines that were making their own soul, and I think they kind of yeah. just gave up. Vibram kind of took over, and they're like, we're just going to do that. But anyway, yeah. we're, we're sitting here like uh, like shoe salesmen at this point. But um, I didn't mention any names. No, I didn't either. Yeah, I, I, I started to. Smart. I thought, let's not do that. Yeah. yeah. Other than Realtree. We mentioned Realtree because we're Cause you, well, well, of course. Yeah, yeah, what are you going to do? Um, so, okay. So you go out, you check this goat out, you destroy your feet. You come back. It wasn't even worth it because it wasn't a goat you wanted. Well, it turned out to be a nanny, an old dry nanny. Yeah. yeah. And she was by I herself. Some, I, know some was, she, I know some of those. I know some old dry nannies. We won't mention those names either. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, so uh, that didn't work out. And uh, then we ended up um, moving that spike camp to another spike camp. Mm -hmm. And that involved about an eight-hour hike, you know, mm -hmm. to another location right. in a saddle farther into the mountains. And this was actually the first year that my guide was a very seasoned guide, a really, uh, really capable, good guy, mm. really knew what he was doing. Uh, but it was the first time he had ever hunted in this area. Mm. So he was at a, a mild disadvantage as far as right. knowing the area. And that, right. that came into play later in the hunt where we had some issues. But um, so we went to another location and uh, got set up and then began hunting from there. Um it, it, it came to my understanding later on that, that um, different clients had different situations. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of uh, guys that were hunting together in camp. One was an older fella mm -hmm. and one was uh, a really big guy, mm -hmm. you know, right. they knew they would have trouble. Right. So they put them in a situation where all they had to do was one hike up yeah. and they got to a plateau and they stayed there for the week. They let right. the goats come to them. Right. And then at the end of the week, they came down. So you and went and got yourself in shape, and, and they and were like, oh, look at this guy. That's <laughs> Bust his ass up this I, hill. I kind of think <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I, I'm not certain of that, but I, I do think that somebody said something to somebody that said, for his age, that guy's in pretty good shape. So, so what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're going to do. <laughs> if I ever go on one of these hunts, I'm taking a shirtless picture <laughs> before I go and being like, <laughs> Easy, boys. <laughs> yeah. Easy. This is a picture uh, of the Buddha here. This yeah, is the guy. Yeah, I'll stick it out a little bit. Yeah. Wait till after a good weekend of carbs and send it on over. So, by contrast, my hunt was up, around, yeah. down, up, around, down until yeah. the day was over. And, of course, it's still daylight at 10 o'clock in the yeah. evening there. So, you get a long day of hunting. Yeah. And you do that for a few days. And it was on day four that we finally uh, sorted everything out. That night, uh, the guide spotted a, a billy on a mountain miles mm -hmm. away. Right. So we took about, uh, we left about 6 in the morning and uh, finally got onto that goat by noon. Right. Okay. And, um, and had to work because of the guy was unfamiliar with these mountains. Didn't right. know whether we would be able to get in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Didn't know whether the back side of the mountain would be a bluff or if we could actually utilize it in order to, to make a stock, you know, right. things like that. So it got complicated that way. But eventually we were able to get up on a, on a, the back of a spine directly across from uh, what we determined was a pretty good billy right. that, was, um, that was in its bed right. facing the cliff. Course. And, you know, what these mountain goats do when they're threatened, if they have a predator that attacks them or whatever, mm -hmm. their instinct is to go for the, the cliffs because they can negotiate that terrain right, right. and the predator cannot. So that's their safety. Right. So if you shoot a billy and it experiences fear or trauma by being shot, the first yeah. thing it's going to do is head for the cliffs. Right. So you have to, if, if you have a, a billy in that kind of position, you either have to not shoot it or you have to make sure somehow to anchor it so right, it doesn't right. go anywhere. So that was the discussion on the mountain top. You know, while we're that we're finally after four days of hunting, we, we got right. w where we want to be. Yeah. And it looks like a good goat, but he's in a bad position. So Brad said to me, you know, Jeff, you have to anchor that goat. I said, I know. He said, I want, I want you to shoot it behind his shoulder because that will anchor it. And, you know, the first rule of, of hunting with a guide is listen to your guide. Sure. You know, they're right, the right. professional. You're paying for their advice. Right. Even if you disagree with it, you listen to them. So right. I did with the caveat that I said to him, well, in my, granted, 
you know, relatively limited experience. Limited experience. You right. know, every every animal, big game animal I've ever shot behind the shoulder died really well, but usually they run away first right, right. until their lungs fill up. Lung shot. Right. Yeah. Right. He said, no, I, that's how you anchor them. you got to shoot them behind the shoulder. I said, I'm thinking it would be better to shoot it through the shoulder <laughs> yeah, to break shoulder. the shoulder right. and get the heart is what, I, you know, right. this is what I'm thinking. He said, no, 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 you shoot it behind the shoulder. Yeah. So, okay, you, you concede to the, the wisdom of the guide. Yeah. And uh, so we got the shot set up, made sure that my uh, r- rifle barrel was clear and I could, wasn't going to, you know, shoot anything in the foreground. Got set. Uh, I had a new uh, piece of gear with me that I've never used before, which is this, um, this, this uh, air bladder that you cover your scope with. It's like a pillow hmm. that protects your scope. If you would fall, you know, okay. it, it doesn't. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. then you, it also oh, doubles smart. as a shooting aid. I was able to put it under my right elbow and, oh, and get, a, yeah. get a good uh, weld for the, the shot. But right before I was ready to shoot, once we deemed everything was good, are you, are you ready? I'm ready. You yeah. know, can I shoot? Yeah. He said, Jeff, shoot it through the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Okay. <laughs> Okay. You're like, I feel much that's, better that's about what, what I'm I about wanted to do. to do. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. And I got to tell you this, just as an aside, you know, I go into hunting camps and, you know, I, I often will refer to myself as an old school guy because mm-hmm. I think I am. I'm not right. only old, but I'm old school. I, right. I, I don't dial. I, right. I, I do not have a scope that dials. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just a hold out on that. It's Right. I understand that they are more precise. I understand all right. of this stuff. It's all fine. It's just not for me because uh, I know my own mindset. Mm. I know how I think, and I still get excited, you know, when I right. when I shoot at an animal. Right. I'm not buck fever excited, but excited enough right. that I could forget to do things correctly. Right. Right. And I I need reading glasses and their little <laughs> numbers and. Right. And I'm used to holdover. I'm used to thinking about the trajectory of my yeah. my bullet. I know what my numbers are, right? And I trust that. And right. it's just simple to me, right? You know, right. I, I don't I don't want to be dealing with all these other factors. So uh, we ranged the the goat at 395 yards, and I know that at 400 yards, my uh, 300 Winchester, 180 grain Acubond will drop 10 inches. So, right. so I figured, you know, the depth of the goat's chest, I just aim at the back line. The wind didn't seem to be right. as much as a I factor. could tell a factor. Right. So it was pretty, a pretty simple shot. And I just dropped it right in and, and it went right through the shoulder and the goat never flinched. It never moved. It just died. So we didn't mm. have that issue, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Picking now up you got to get to it though, right? Yeah. I'm sure that 400 yards was not a, uh, you were on a spine, right? So did you stay up and go around? Was he also on a? It was. A, I was shooting straight across. Okay, so so I had to go, I had to go way down. And way, oh, it took me about an fine. hour to get over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah go way up. Yeah. And the first thing I did, Brad was there first. Yeah, of course. I had to go back and get some equipment that I had dumped on the mountainside, and uh, so when I got close to him, I, I yelled. I said, "Is it a Billy?" You know, right, I just wanted right. to make sure. Yeah, right. And he said, "Oh yeah, it was." You know, yeah. and it turned out to be a hell of a Billy. It was. Yeah, uh, it's a monster. You know, I had nine and a half, nine and three quarter uh, on there on the horn, and uh, and Brad scored it. Gross score, of course, prior to drying, but it had enough numbers in it. It was well right. over the maximum, uh, the minimum. I mean, right. for right. the for the score, he, he figured it'll handily yeah. make book. So yeah. it turned out to be a, a big, big goat. Yeah, you know, that's when the fun starts. You get to do all the cutting and carrying, which is always always fun. But so, how many days after that did you uh, until you flew back, or was it is it is that set up basically once you're successful, do what you need to do, and they get you back to base camp? And yeah, everybody wants you back at base camp, you know, and uh, you know just for liability and, and sure, and, uh, right, you know, and everybody wants to go back to base camp because there's a shower there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But as you say, that's when the work begins. So you know, we broke down that goat. And, you know, that 45 pounds of camp that you're carrying around yeah. now becomes yeah. 100 pounds. Right. Okay. And this is where my guide's inexperience with that particular geography came into play. Because uh, what we had to do is we had to hike back to, to, that, um, to that spike camp, 
but right around the corner of the mountain, it looked like right around the corner, was a lake with a big meadow in front of it. Right. And it was his idea, well, they've never landed on that lake, but why can't they land on that lake? That oh. would be closer to go to. Yeah. We should do that. Yeah. Looks like we'll have a little bit of bushwhacking. Shouldn't be too bad. You know, and so that was the plan. So we hiked back to the spike camp. And, in the, and it was a brutal day because in the morning, right when we were starting out, the wind was probably 50 miles an hour. It would, right. it would knock you down if you weren't careful, literally. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, we're trying to break camp in that wind, you know, disassembled tent and all that stuff. You're, that your hands are frozen. You're freezing. And, uh, you know, it's so cold. You're either really hot or really cold yeah. in that right. environment, depending right. on the weather. And uh, so we had a really long, uh, again, we had a, a six-hour hike mm. down to where we cached the meat because we, we cached it nearby right. down there right. and the hide. And um, it turned out we had another five hours after that <laughs> with 100-pound packs <laughs> bushwhacking the whole way because the big timber was still full of, of balsam firs. And I'm telling you, I don't know why they bother with a razor wire around a prison wall when they could have planted balsam firs because those buggers do not yield. Right. You can't. You see two fir trees, you want to walk between them, good luck. Yeah. You, you get captured by them. You can't get through. Yeah. And the creek was, was deep and rugged and, and, and you know, frothy, and uh, it was hot. And it was nothing but crisscrossing that creek and trying to get through these pines yeah. for five more hours to get to that meadow, that beautiful meadow that was our goal. Right. And it was in my my uh, stalwart guide, even at the end, finally conceded that it was a death march. All right. Because right. we had 11 hours of hiking total, half of that with these ridiculous packs. Right. Right. And uh, and it was on the way there that I I, I kind of hit my ultimate wall you know you yeah you get to the point of your limitations you say i don't think i can do this anymore right right but you don't have any choice so you you, you push past that right and then you you hit it again yeah. but you don't have any choice <laughs> yeah. so you push past that and you do that a hundred times right you know right. and and you realize i am in a great physical ordeal here i'm just yeah. sort of in a numb zone now yeah but then i got to one point where i really did hit the actual wall right at one point uh, trying to bust through all that that brush I, uh, I I had that heavy pack, and I finally sat down for a rest, and then it was time to get up again, and I couldn't get up. Right. My my legs, my back, nothing would work. Yeah. You know, and I've done a lot of physical things in my life. You know, right. I'm in pretty good shape, but I actually was at the real wall now. Right. Right. And uh, and I'll never forget this. Um, Kathy and I were, my wife Kathy and I were in communication on my inReach. Mm -hmm. And I had said to her the previous day, I said, you know, this is getting pretty tough. The accumulation right, of right. all this is really getting right. to be a trial. Yeah. I said, I'd appreciate a prayer. Right. You know, and it was at that point that I recalled, okay, Jeff, your wife is praying for you. Right, right, You know, right. and that gave me the, right. the energy to somehow stand up again. And, and then I, a few hours later, I was still standing. And we got to our meadow finally. Mm. You know, hallelujah, we're there. And it yeah. turned out our meadow, which you pictured like a football field, was nothing swamp. but what it was it was chest high willows <laughs> in a swamp yeah in a marsh that was a mile and a half wide oh my you know so we had that till we get to the lake and yeah. by the end it, it was tough yeah. it, it was a you know a real tough yeah. pack out yeah so you know anybody that's thinking of doing that kind of a hunt you know you have to consider that this is a, a true physical endeavor that you have to be as mentally prepared for if not physically as you yeah. can Unless you get to plateau, <laughs> unless you get picked to go up to the plateau. No, I, re I remember, I know exactly what you're talking about with that wall. I was a much younger buck back in the day, but um, that meant I had to pack everything out, right? Everyone I was hunting with, all the other guys were in their 40s and 50s and everything. And I'm there at 23, 24 years old, 25 years old, full of piss and vinegar, yeah. you know, and, and uh, I did know to go around basins instead of down basins as, as much as you could because sure. it's a lot longer, but it's Easier. not the down and up, right? Um, excuse me. So we had one particular day where we had just a ton of success, and I ended up packing out two for my guys and then another one late afternoon 
that ended up in a really bad spot. And then right at dark, I'm getting back to camp, and I, right at dark, I hear a crack. And I'm like, oh, no, because I knew everybody else was beat. I was beat. I mean, I was destroyed. I had packed out three elk in one day, and I was done. That's crazy. And I went down, and this, this was a bigger guy, and uh, great dude. His name was Dan, and Dan cracked a hell of a bull. He really did. But he shot it in the worst possible worst possible spot was it down in a hole yeah completely down in a hole i mean and what was frustrating was it was climbing and the shot was like 225 yards well it would have been like maybe 300 had he let it get to the top now granted this wasn't a top we could access with a horse or anything like that but at least it would have been a a lateral you know it wouldn't have been an uphill carry so he took the shot where he had it you know hey he's a pan client what are you gonna do you know, he took a good shot, and unfortunately it dropped right away. Um, and I went down, and then when I got down there, you know, Dan was down there, and Dan wasn't carrying anything out. Like, there's Dan's going to have a hard time getting out himself, right? So um, the guide, the other guide was like, well, um, he, he wanted the head. He wanted the cape, the whole thing for this thing. So, okay, now we're adding another. The elk rack, the head, the cape, that weight, right? Um, and That's a lot only, of weight. Yeah, and there's only two of us down there. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll take – I ended up saying I'll take both hinds and a front. And the, and the other guide took the head, and he was staying back to cape it out as much as he could, get as much weight off that cape as he could. Sure. No neck, you know, whatever. Did so you, he was did take you bone them. out the, the hind quarters? No. Just took them bone in? We just bone in. Okay. Just strapped them in the back of my pack, and you're like leaning back, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, you got to be leaning forward. And I'm looking up, and my horse is – a long ways away and I got to climb this face and I'm and I learned a long time I learned early on through that whole process to to not look up and not look down yeah. <laughs> just look at what's right in front of you and don't because as soon as I would look up see what I had left I knew I was screwed yeah. like because I because it, it just mentally just does something to you unless you're right near the top right and but even then I I fought that because there were so many times where I thought well I'm near the top you know, I'm going to look up and see all the more further I have to go. And I look up and it's like 800 more yards. It's right? discouraging. Like, yeah. And then you're like, oh, shoot. I thought I was up near the top, right? I did but, that all um, week the other week. Yeah. So day. so I, I did that thing. I just, you know, one foot in front of the other. And to your point, I'd hit a wall. And then I hit another wall. And then I hit another wall. And I, I remember distinctly the, the point where you're like, I, I can't do this anymore. Where your body is just giving up to the point of like, Exhaustion. I, yeah, I mean, you have, you have kids, and I have kids, and it, literally, like, if you would have said, well, you need to be at the top of this hill in 10 minutes or something bad is going to happen to your child. Like, even if you gave yourself something like that, which is a terrible way to motivate yourself, but you couldn't have done it. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't have done it, right? right. So um, I, I got to the point of, like, I'd pick out a spot, you know, 15 steps in front of me and be like, make it to that. And I'd get to 10, and I couldn't do it. You know, I mm -hmm. couldn't even make it to that. Um, and at one point, and this is a particular spot where my father-in-law and I had hunted, and I knew there were cougars living in this particular basin, right? And it's now 1 o'clock in the morning. By the time we've gotten this thing, you know, I mean, it's late. It's real late, and I'm exhausted because we started at 5 a.m. And by the time we got down there, you got it all, you know, broken down and everything. Um, it's pushing 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm completely by myself. I didn't take a weapon down, you know, and I've got raw meat You on didn't my want back. the weight. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to carry it. And um, I remember hearing a cat go off, and it was it was somewhere in this basin. But I heard this cat sound off, and I mean that just gives you a chill anyway, right? And here I am, this, you know, a walking this, hunk of a uh, walking hunk of raw meat. odor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And at one point, and it may not have been close, but it sounds close, no matter what, right? You hear a cat go off, and you're defenseless, and you're covered in raw meat. The death knell um, is I, always a I, close sound. I yeah. literally <laughs> laid down. I ended up in my exhaustion lying down and just thinking, there's enough meat on my back. Maybe it won't kill me. Yeah. Thinking like right. resigning myself to the fact that I might lie here while cats feed on my back, <laughs> like on this meat uh. that's on my back, right? Um, thankfully, obviously, none of that ever came to be. But um, I will never forget, I got to the top and uh, – 
we had another guy that needed a guide the next morning. I, I end up, you know, strapping everything to the horse, and I, I take the horse back to camp, to our spike camp. Everyone's sitting around, having a couple beers, and whatever. I'm like, oh, you know, like, I'm looking at the other guys like, look, I know you're tired. I'm not doing that ever again. Yeah. Not by myself. That was just too much, you know, to only have two guys down there. and Because the thing was, we knew where it was before I went out after it, and no one else would go. But, you know, those kinds of things happen. But, yeah, that, that wall's a real thing. So... Well, I think when you have a, a really physical hunt, whether you're a guide or whether you're on the hunting end of it, if it's an yeah. extremely physical hunt, um, you know, you're in great country, you're in, having a wonderful experience, but the price of admission is high. Right. And uh, it, it does counteract a little bit some of the joy while you're there. But every day that goes by after you're yeah. out of that. Right. That diminishes, yep. And, yep. and you begin to feel the reward of yep. all of that work. I, I remember every detail of that climb, Yeah, and I've packed out dozens of other elk, and I remember one or two of them, but that's because of who it was for or, or whatever the other situation was. But it does make it stand out. And as you're telling your story, I'm sitting there listening going, you wouldn't have wanted it any other way because had you gone out there and climbed the plateau and they had, and even had that first goat been a good billy and you landed – and went out and four hours later pulled that trigger and the next day you're flying back out having experienced that with hunter our, our daughter who's gone out and killed amazing elk right she got them both on the first day at the end of the first day both times but what i would have given have four or five days of that right it's just that time because again it comes back to the experience of the that's hunt, right not the, the, because that's when the work begins that's also i mean there's still experiences to be had there but the pursuit, you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum, right? The the pursuit is is the whole thing. And to the point where I'm at that age now where I'm, I don't even care if I kill something. I'm more about the pursuit. I'll go sit out there and take a picture of the thing. I don't care. Um, you know, save it for the kids kind of thing. But uh, Well, on that first trek out at the beginning of the hunt, I, I was thinking, walking out there, wow, what if this is it? Yeah. What if I What if I tag out on this first day? In yeah. a way, that would be great because I have a feeling that I have a lot of right. intense work ahead of me. Right. But then when I realized it wasn't going to happen, I said, okay, that's not the way this is going to go. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna do it completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a couple other things I want to touch on. I mean, we're at 36 minutes, so, uh, you know, we, we don't want to roll over an hour. People have short attention spans anymore. But um, you've had several other hunts. Right, so you have a you have a record mountain lion. You've hunted caribou. Um, did did you hunt buffalo as well, or your wife, just Kathy? Kathy, w Kathy went on a buffalo. bison hunt. The bison hunt, okay. And I just okay. accompanied her. Okay, yeah. so you've but you've you have a list in your head of of, of I'm sure you do, right? Because you're an author. You just have your your uh, your uh, table of contents there. Well, but. you know, I mean. I'm always self-conscious anytime I talk to anybody, and especially in something like this. You know, I, right. I'm not an accomplished hunter. I don't have hundreds of hunts under my belt. Yeah. I'm like most average guys that do this sort of thing. I had to wait till I was retired to do it. Right. So I'm playing catch up. Um, you know, I have, I don't know, somewhere in the high teens in terms of numbers of expeditions I've been on. Right. It's, it's not a lot. So I speak from it's a, a lot. Of, it's a lot compared to a lot of guys. And what I love about it is that you're very intentional about how you set these up. You set a goal. You say, this is a hunt I would like to experience. And even down to your selection of guns, which I know we could talk about that forever. But um, just so folks know, um, when Jeff plans a hunt, he has. Uh, let me back this up. Jeff lives on a farm. Jeff's farm is pristine. His barn in his at his farm is pristine. You it's, walk into this barn. It's uncluttered. That's <laughs> uncluttered. <all>. His <laughs> his tractor. Well, how many horsepower is that tractor? It's it's, it's a, a six, small tractor. It's, it's a, a seventy five seventy five horse. horsepower. Big old tractor compared it's, to everyone else around here that I know. Not a speck of dust on this thing. That that the the diesel cans are perfectly separated by six inches. It's not they have that no dust good. on them. Everything, <laughs> everything in its place and every place has a thing, right? Like it's, it's exactly uh, his porch. You paint your porch every year? You paint your porch every year. I we know the answer to this. Some so, of my porch every year. Yeah, yeah. So basically, Better Homes and Gardens has nothing on Jeff. <laughs> um, 
but you just that, turned that, me into an OCD guy right there. It's oh, not really that bad. Oh, you're 100 percent OCD. <laughs> nah, I, I will. Uh, all right, I'm gonna have to get a picture of your 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 barn uh, and put it on this podcast so people know. It's not that but, good. But uh, Kathy, you're over here on the side. OCD. Oh yeah, OCD. Yeah, confirmed. Your your uh, your opinion is null and void, Jeff. But um, but what I do love about that is when it comes to by the way, when you open where I was going with this is when you open his gun safe. Every gun is immaculately maintained. You have some very old guns in there, um, some some different calibers. But what I love about it is when you when you pull a weapon out, you can say, "I use this on this hunt." There's stories. You're attaching stories to the to the to those weapons and the process that you go through when you when you're looking at the next hunt you're going to go on of. Okay, I could take three. Which of these three do I want to take? Well, that's and a big which, part of it. That's and, right. And which one hasn't? It, it, as I've understood it, and correct that, me if I'm wrong, right. but it's like, which one of these haven't I paid enough attention to with a hunt? So maybe I could take this one, but uh, I took that one on this last hunt, and this one might feel a little left out. So we're going to, not that I'm, I'm probably overly personifying it. Well, but, at the uh, risk of sounding overly poetic, <laughs> I will say, truthfully, you know, I these are these are grand experiences to me right successful or not they're, they're i'm going to somewhere that's a, a a special location right for a special experience right and um and and because i'm a writer there's a there's a always a very reasonable chance that it'll be recorded you know in a magazine right. article right okay right. so there's photographs there's words there's all these aspects to it, and the firearm is another part of that. Right. So when I open that safe, what I see is like uh, an artist that, that right. looks at his easel right. and says, which of these tools am I going to use to create this experience? Right. You know, it's part of it. Yeah. That's how I look yeah. at it. That's not overly poetic at all. <laughs> not one bit. Right. <laughs> not one it, bit. Out of context. I mean, I'm be. an artist, but I'm not <laughs> being poetic about it. But... Uh, yeah, no, uh, part, I, part I, of the planning no, is, the, I love is, the, that. is the firearm. So, yeah. yeah, what, what are you going to use? That. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. speaking of writing, who all have you written for? I have contributed over the past several years since retirement to Sports Afield several times, uh, a competing magazine of super high quality that is not quite as well known, uh, called Sporting Classics. Okay. It's based in North Carolina. I have. Uh, just done one for the Dallas Safari Club Journal, which is called mm -hmm. Game Trails. Mm -hmm. A smattering of other things, you know, the Pennsylvania Game News, yeah. uh, Hunting Fool, right? You know, uh, right. Think, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, of of those, um, can we do a brief version of a couple of those other hunts? So, I well, first of all, goat hunt aside, I know it's the most recent, so it may have the most. Um, I don't know if it would have the most allure now. Uh, uh, which one, if you, if okay, let me let me rephrase this or phrase it for the first time because I haven't managed to get the words out. Um, if someone, of the hunts that you've had, independent of their own personal preferences, et cetera, cap someone capable of doing each of the hunts that you've done, which one would you recommend if they could only do one? I, I would probably say Mountain Caribou. Because once again, it's in the mountains. Yeah. In our case, it was in Northwest Territories. We were 60 miles south of the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. extremely remote, yeah. uh, extremely um, desolate, and yet amazingly beautiful. Right. And and that's an experience that, in and of itself, is is worth pursuing. You know, apart yeah. from the animal, it's it's just that that environment. Right. Now, I, I I love hunting elk better than anything. Right, right. For, for hunting the animal. Yeah. And you know why. Yeah, but it's like a thousand pound gobbler. Exactly. It's like <laughs> hunting turkeys, except they can smell you. We all say that. Yeah. But um, I, I would rather hunt elk as far as the animal goes over anything. But it, again, it's it's destinations. Yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, hunters get to see things that no one else sees yeah. because they are the only ones with a motivation to get that far back in. Right. You know, and so. Unless you work for National Geographic or yeah, something. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's not exclusive, but it's pretty, yeah, much, yeah, pretty yeah. much true. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, for me, a lot of it is destination. You know, I've seen some beautiful ranches in New Mexico like you have. 
you know, I've been to Hawaii hunting. I've been to Alaska, um, you know, different parts of the Southwest and the Midwest. We haven't hit that uh, New Zealand hunt yet, though. Not yet. I'm kind of saving that Not one. Not yet. Kind of saving yeah. that one, but I can't save it too long. Yeah. Because that's a mountain hunt, too, you know, yeah. if you want to get a, a tar or a chamois down there. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, you know, uh, next year we'll be in Africa. We'll be in Botswana okay. in the spring. Yeah. And uh, I have a doll hunt lined up, uh, hopefully, for next year, too. Wow. So there's things happening, but I, I would, I would, it's those mountains that, yeah. that really have such an allure. Right. If you take a hunt like that, you come home knowing that you've touched a, a part of your own, uh, you know, psyche that you never right. would have experienced because you were so far away from yeah. civilization. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to that point, I mean, you know, there's so many people that have never experienced even even that nighttime, right? I mean, I, I will have nights here, and I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, middle of nowhere for western Pennsylvania, right? Right. And um, we know we still have light pollution and things like that. And you think, oh, I, I, look how many stars you can see tonight. And then you go there. And you're, I used to guide up in northwestern Colorado, right, up by Maybell, Meeker. And then you'd hike back in or ride back in, you know, horseback, whatever, 16, 18 miles. And there's nothing up there. Denver's hundreds and hundreds of miles away, right? So that light pollution is gone. And to lie there at night and just see how many there really are, and knowing that even then you're only seeing a small percentage of them just because, you know, we can't detect it, right, um, is just I, – I, I, it's, it's sad to me that everyone doesn't get to experience that. It makes it valuable to me because I have yeah. and knowing others haven't. But th that's the selfish part of it, right? Yeah. The other part of it is I honestly wonder how the world would be different if people got a chance to, to go out there. And I, I actually now I think it would scare people more than anything. If you had to put your phone down and experience that, you know, and, and be with nothing but yourself and the, and the stars or nothing but yourself in the mountains, I think a lot of people would probably uh, – be more terrified of that than, than anything else. But uh, I think so. Really and, you know, that, and, and you can compare that to how it was a generation ago without the technology we have, yeah. because it is getting even, even that experience today is watered down somewhat. Right. You know, GPS is the new way to get lost. Right. 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 Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, we were in communication through satellite communicator, yeah. you yeah. know, it would be better yet if you didn't have any of that. Oh yeah. You know, it's yeah. just on your Other own. Other than for her worrying that you, Fell into a crevasse. <laughs> <laughs> Problem. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. just real quick, and, and I'm definitely going to have you back on again if you're comfortable with that because I want to talk about the mountain lion hunt. So you have a, you have a book mountain lion, right? I do. And how, how, what, was the, what were the dimensions of that? Uh, they go by skull, and yeah. I think that uh, the minimum dimension on that, if I'm not mistaken, is 15. Yeah. And mine was over 15. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Big I had cat. three guys measure it. Three guys got three different dimensions. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. really care yeah. about that. Right. To me, right. that's only a reference. I am not a numbers guy. Right. I, I don't, I, I don't, if, if it makes the book, that gives you an idea that it was a quality animal right. of a certain size. Right. That's all that means to me. Right. Right. Uh, in fact, that's the only one of those that we got scored because to me, the process was lugubrious. I, I didn't want to do it again. I'm sorry. The process was what? It was um, – No, say that word again. Lugubrious. Okay. No one knows what that means. <laughs> it wasn't – No one knows It, it was what that painstaking means. and not fun. Fair and enough. Got sad it. Sad to I'm go a, through all I that. I consider myself a smart guy. <laughs> First time ever. Well, First actually, it ever wasn't ever the best word to use. But it was close. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm but using it, it now <laughs> randomly. <laughs> the, <laughs> the <laughs> things are getting lugubrious <laughs> over here. <laughs> but Kathy, uh, she has a, a, an e what's easily a, a, a BC book. Uh, caribou and oh, yeah. we're not even taking it in right we're not, we're not right, doing right. It. we don't care right right yeah yeah like you said though it does it does um it's in, in a way it's a testament to the quality of the animal that you were able to 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 package in with the rest of the experience well i like from, the organization the, the yeah. organizations have good conservation right. results but i right. i personally don't that's like uh safari club international i'm a member there too and you know, they have checklists, you know, all, yeah. everybody is, is, you can get awards for all yeah. the animals. Yeah. I I like that they do that because it spurs people to hunt. Right. 
you know, some people were motivated that way. I personally am not. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not trying to collect anything. Right. I, I right. just have certain ideas about things that appeal to me right. and I'm going to pursue those things that appeal to me. Right. I don't even, there's yeah. no rhyme or reason to them. Yeah. You know. So last thing I'd be uh, remiss and Chloe would be mad at me if I didn't ask how the farm's looking this year. Terrible. Really? I, I made a mistake. I, uh, I tried to, I got lazy. I got under the gun and I thought, I wonder if instead of spraying all that round up and then tilling, if I could just till it, and maybe till it again, hoping that <laughs> turn up know, weeds and then turn up more weeds. <laughs> well, it all came up grass. Oh yeah, it's all grass. Yeah. It, that that doesn't work. But you got, I mean, you got property though. I mean, you got white oaks or anything up there. Yeah, I mean, it'll be okay. Yeah. There's still a green opening, and there's still a few forbs in there. Yeah. It, whatever. And honestly, I, I'm you know I just came home from from the goat hunt, and I'm leaving in a few weeks for a moose hunt. Yeah, and I, I, I'll do whatever whitetail thing we do right. when I get back. I'm not right. worrying much about right. it. Right. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, it, it's also an opportunity, right? Because I know, I know at home, you, what you're talking about is hunting over food plots. Yes. Yes. Which I think you know, I'm I'm not a fan of that anyway. Like I, yeah. I, I know when I was when I was learning about hunting, it was about the staging areas and about yeah. getting back. And you know, you don't hunt over the crop field because the buck wait till it's dark. They hang out in these staging areas where all right. these rubs are, eighty yards back. Like get back there, figure out where they're hitting the acorns before they go hit the corn. Um, and this year, you know, we're making an even more intentional move towards that of saying, okay, just naturally, given what's on these hillsides, given where the food sources are from local crops or whatever, you know, where are the best pinch points, where are the best funnels and, and things like that. That's trying all solid back, strategy. Trying to just get back, hunting the wind instead of, you know, oh, well, I've got this set of clothing on now. It ain't going to work, buddy. The only but, reason um, that we do things the way we do, how we evolve that way is because being that it was a farm. Yeah. You know, right. it was all farmed, and, and the woodlots are, are not deep. Right. You right. know, right. It, right. You, the staging area and the crop area, they're <laughs> the same all, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're all There's the same. not that much difference. Yeah. 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 Well, if you don't mind, Brock and I might go walk around up there, see if we can find some you have trails. You are more than Especially welcome. while you're out there hunting moose. I'll be up there trying to take your white tail off you. But that, uh, or he yeah. will. Not yeah, me. You're, I'll just be having a camera. You're, you're allowed. Yeah. Do you have an yeah. open invitation? I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, again, yeah. thank you so much. This yeah. has been great. Uh, okay. We're, uh, again, thanks for hanging out in the corn thicket. We're presented by Real Tree. Um, you mind coming back after that moose hunt? We can do it. We'll do another chat and we'll cover some more about that line. I want to get into that whole hunt and I know we can talk for hours about all these things. So uh, I'm going right. to have you back a couple of times if you don't mind. Oh, so. yeah. I'm happy to come in. All right. Thanks, thank Jeff. Okay, bud. Go. Ah!